A promise is a pledge to provide a service. I'm not promising you'll be entertained. I'm not promising we're the best show in town. What I am promising is to teach you biblical truth with practical application. I promise to teach men to fight for their faith, their families, and their futures through the word of God. I'm Douglas Gumby, lead pastor of the Contenders Church. Join us in the fight at contenderschurch.org. Uh, but in the book of Luke, chapter 24, uh, verses 13 through 16 is where we'll be for today. Uh, it simply says this, and behold, two of them went the same, the same day to the village, to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem, about three score furlongs. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were holding that they should not know him. This year in an effort uh, to, to look at the church, as, as, as my eyes have been opened, I want to make sure that we go after and teach people how to believe. There are a lot of people who have the ears of people but are not saying a lot. I want to make sure that what we say is actually sinking in to your heart and being activated in your life. I don't want to just stand up here and give you a suitcase full of stuff and you take it home and say, here, God bless me and give it to somebody else and you not be able to use this for yourself. As we continue our efforts this year, we, we classified uh, and, and, and do a Facebook check-in each Sunday morning where we ask you to, to uh, hashtag Reclaiming the Believer 2016. And, and I believe that that is important because we have a lot of people who go to church, but not necessarily a lot of people who believe. And I want to make sure that we reach those who believe. People who go to church sometimes do that out of formality or out of tradition. But then there are a lot of people who have been in the church so long and seen so many things that they basically don't go to church anymore. They're sitting at, at home right now watching TV and doing other things because there's so much happening inside the church that it's, it stifles a person's growth if we allow it. My job today is to talk to us about our belief. My job today, as always, is to tell us to stand firm on the salvation that God offers. My, 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 my biggest uh, question that I posed this week was, was last week just a thing? Like Resurrection Sunday, y'all came in, some of y'all didn't have y'all seats, and I saw your face when you saw folks sitting in your seat because you don't never come to church, but they were there <laughs> last week. You know, and, and it's like, I want to do one of them MTV shows. Where are they now? <laughs> you know, was, was last week just a thing? Was last week your celebration of Easter? I'm not talking to you because you're here. But was it your celebration of Easter so that you can show off your outfit? Was last week just so that you can come in and, and, and be amongst the saints and show them that you trust God and that you believe in God and God has been good? Or was last week something to make you put into question your salvation and your redemption because of the sacrifice of Christ. That's what it was for me. When I look at the resurrection, I don't just look at it as an event. I've had several events that happened to me this week. Those events have come and those events have gone. But there's one event that has changed the course of time for us all. This week, uh, Tuesday, Wednesday morning, uh, because I've had other events happening, I, I was able to finally start my notes on Wednesday morning. And because I hadn't done it in my normal routine, my body was ready to get my notes done. So at 2.30 Wednesday morning, I was awakened hearing this statement. I literally heard my voice making this statement. Many are faithful, but not useful. Many are useful, but not faithful. For the time that is ours to share, I, I want to speak from this simple topic, shaken, not stirred. I know some of y'all have seen James Bond. That's where I kind of got it from. 
uh, and I chose not to use any martinis in our <laughs> high graphics. I didn't want to confuse the saints. Oh, we can drink again. Okay, no. <laughs> three things, three things I want to give you in order to understand whether or not you're shaken or stirred. Uh, the first thing I want you to pay attention to, you must check your response. Check your response. Luke chapter 24, verses 13 and 14. It says, and behold, two of them went the same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem about three score furlongs. And they talked together of all these things which has had happened. Each person, this is what I've learned. And, 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 and my wife said it best as she came up when we first got married, we had expectations. Expectations. All of us have expectations. And I need you to understand something. Even though we have different expectations, that simply means we are wired differently. We're going to handle things differently. The way you handle things is not going to be the way I handle things. And the way I handle things, just because it's the way I handle things, doesn't make it right for you. Right? Some respond to pressure. Some respond to things well and others not so well. But I, I found this out. Each gospel presents the resurrection of Christ just like us in its own way. There are four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Two were eyewitness accounts and two were uh, 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 testimonies of others. Though none give a detailed description of how these the events happen, we can sort of piece together uh, and develop an idea of what happened in and around the gospel time. Some things are clear in the gospels. Three things that are pointed out in each gospel. There was an empty tomb. Thank God. Number two, there were disi the disciples' hesitancy to believe. They were with Christ, but yet we find the disciples hiding because of disbelief. I'll get into that in a few minutes. And lastly, there's a, a prominence of appearing, of the appearance to the women. Each gospel also has something that does not appear in the others. Luke, where we are today, includes the account of the walk to Emmaus and related events. Now Mark 16 and 7 says something about two walking uh, 16 and 7 and 8 uh, says something about the two walking, but Luke kind of gives us details. And I want to pull this out because I, I want to help us to, to, to understand how important it is uh, that we understand the events around the resurrection, that everything plays into it. Number one, you have two men. One of these two disciples was Cleophas. He was, he was mentioned by name or Alphaeus. Uh, said by one, one of the ancients to be the brother of Joseph, which is Jesus' stepfather in a sense because God is his father. Jo Joseph uh, married Mary, and Mary was already pregnant, but it wasn't nobody else in the picture but God. You can laugh. It's okay. That was funny to me. Um, <laughs> Joseph was Christ's supposed father. Uh, not, not only do you have two men, but now I want you to pay attention. They are, they are in action. They are walking. As they are walking, they went to a village called Emmaus, which is reckoned to be about two hours walk from Jerusalem. It is here to be said about 60 furlongs or seven measured miles. I'm saying this for a purpose because I need this. This is going to stick out to us in a few minutes. Uh, and, and, and lastly, not only do you have two men, not only are they walking, uh, but there's also a conversation. They are discussing uh, the event of the crucifixion and headed to Emmaus, pay attention, towards Galilee. Now, one of these two men, Cleophas, gives the account of how they learned of the resurrection in Luke chapter 24, verses 18 through 24. I'm going to go ahead and read 22 through 24, excuse me. Yea, and certain women also of our company made us astonished. Now, let's stop and pause right there. Now, I thought that when, when Mary went to the tomb, she went to the tomb with Peter and John. Didn't happen. Didn't happen that way. Mary went to the tomb first. Mary and uh, uh, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James. They went to the tomb first to dress the body of Jesus, right? 
when they got to the tomb, you find this as you go through. You can't just read one scripture and say, oh, I'm smart. You got to go in and see how everything plays together. I'm going to verify what I said right here. Uh, the, 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 yea, certain women uh, uh, also of our company made us astonished, which were early at the sepulcher. And when they found not his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels, which said that he was alive. Now, who are we talking about? We're talking about Jesus the Christ. We're talking about the resurrection. Now you have Mary and Mary, not Mary, Mary from the singing, I love God, but I'm saying Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, went to the tomb. They were they were uh, uh, they met there an angel who told them that Jesus was alive. They came back now as they come back and certain of them which were with us uh, went to the sepulcher and found it even so as the women had said, but they saw him not now in this story, Mary and Mary now with Peter and John go to the sepulcher. You, you see the piecing together. I, I don't want to just come in and have church and shout and we don't know what we're talking about. Now all four of them go and as they go, now they're, re, uh, uh, now, now they're approached by Jesus himself. Right? So here we are. The journey on the road to Emmaus tells us something about these two disciples. We said they were men, but actually they were disciples. Most of the time when we're in church, we only think of the disciples as the twelve. But when we read later on in Matthew 28, we find out that there were over 500 different disciples, but there were 12 who walked with Jesus and who were noted to walk with Jesus everywhere. When determining if you're shaken and not stirred, you must check your response. Secondly, you must communicate and reason. Am I taking my time today? I'm doing my best. Luke chapter 24, verses 15 and 16. And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were holding that they should not know him. I made this statement and I put it out last night. Experience becomes a great teacher when things don't add up. Experience becomes a great teacher when things don't add up, meaning our experiences should cause us to activate our ability to reason. Every person in this room, uh, whether you're emotional or logical, has an ability to reason. These two disciples talked over the recent events. They reasoned with themselves of the probability of Christ's resurrection. Now, here it is. They were all disciples. They were with him. They sat just like you are now listening to me and they listened to him. Jesus said to his disciples, not just the 12, but you got to understand he took a crowd with him wherever he went. He said to his disciples, I am going to be, I'm going to be put on trial. I'm going to be executed and killed. But on the third day, I'm going to get up. Now we have two men walking down this road, a seven mile stretch of road to Emmaus. Now I want, this is going to make sense in a few minutes. To Emmaus and Emmaus is seven miles of the 63 miles from Galilee. Keep that in mind. That's going to come back to help us in a few minutes. When we communicate and reason, it is easy to discover that there is still room for us to doubt what we believe to be true. Now, here it is. Jesus said, even at the Last Supper, Jesus said, I'm going to die, but I'm going to get up. Here it is. The day after the, or the day of the resurrection, these two heard the news when Mary and Mary came to the disciples and said, they've taken him. He's gone. Then Peter and John went with Mary and Mary and they, they too found out that Jesus was gone. Now we have these disciples because they were given instructions. How, how do we come to this conclusion? That, that they, were, they were in a sense of disbelief. I came to this conclusion because of what Jesus said to them as they walked together. Let's read it. Luke chapter 24 and verse 17. 
and 18, he said unto them, what manner of communications are these that you have one to another as you walk and you are sad? Now, I believe God. I believe every person in this room to some extent, whether it's a great belief or a growing belief, you believe God. Now, here's the thing. I don't care how much you believe God, it's difficult to believe him beyond your own limitations. That's what I've discovered. And one of them said, whose name was Cleophas, answering him, said unto him, art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem? And has thou not known the things which are come to pass in these days? It is often difficult. It is often difficult to stand on belief when you cannot get a grip on reality. It's hard to believe what you believe when nothing you see makes sense. The disciples, I want to go down a list of some things that happened. The disciples heard the words of Christ's sacrifice. They listened to the promise of his return. They watched him handle betrayal. They witnessed his incarceration. They scarcely attended his trial. They observed his execution. And then they went into hiding. That, that's how it happened. Uh, we discover the women went to the tomb with sweet spices to anoint Jesus' body. Again, it's Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James. The women encountered the angel at the tomb. And here, in, in, in going to book, the book of Mark, another gospel, Mark chapter 16 and verse 7, uh, the angel says this to Mary and Mary, but go your way and tell his disciples and Peter that he goes before you into Galilee. There you will see him and as he said unto you. Here we find two disciples traveling down the road to Emmaus. What I see in this picture is that there were two disciples who were obedient to God regardless of the circumstance. This is what I'm discovering as I continue to grow in church and ministry. I'm understanding that everybody's here to believe, but everybody's not ready to believe. Everybody's here to grow, but everybody does not grow at the same pace. The disciples now traveling down the road to Emmaus, Two disciples headed to the, in the direction of Galilee. Two disciples communicating and reasoning. Two disciples talking to Christ unknowingly. When determining if you are shaken and not stirred, you must realize and check your response. You must also communicate and reason. And here is the crux of what I want to share with you today. There must be continual reminders. You must be reminded daily, day in and day out. You know what I discovered? I realized that I don't go through stuff because I'm so righteous and God loves me so much that he decides to test me. I go through stuff because the stuff helps me to remember how good God is to me. Luke chapter 24, verse 30 through 32. And it came to pass... Uh, as he sat at meat with them, he took bread and blessed it and break and gave to them. And their eyes were open and they knew him and he vanished out of their sight. And they said one to another, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us, talked with us by the way. And while he opened to us the scriptures, where we are in this portion of the scripture these two disciples now joined by Jesus but not able to see him because he does not look like Jesus they remember. Their eyes were, were shut to who he was. They are walking down the street. They arrive two hours later at Emmaus at the house possibly of Alphaeus and as they are there Jesus, this is what I love, takes control of the house. This is Alpheus' house, I'm assuming. As he's at his house, it's my house. 
Nobody tells me what to do in my house. Except my wife. She kind of, I don't know how she took control. I thought I was in control. I realized I wasn't. Uh, but I'm over that now. Uh, but you can't come in my house and tell me not to put my foot on my coffee table. That's my coffee table. If I want to put my, my, my if I want to sit on my, if I want to go to sleep on my, that's my coffee table. Here it is. Now, Jesus has walked with them and he says, look, I'm going to keep walking. Y'all go ahead. They said, no, no, you got to come with us. It's too late. Just come on in. It's too late. Come on in. So he came with them and I'm trying to figure out how can you come in my house and all of a sudden you're in control of the table. And as he's in control of the table, we find that Jesus does something that had never been done before except for at the Last Supper. He broke bread. When he broke bread, he gave thanks because they had seen him do it before. You don't understand God unless you spend time with him. You won't understand, you, it, it'll just be church and religion and tradition unless you spend time with God. Jesus broke bread, gave thanks, and he gave to them. And when they looked and saw him break bread and give thanks, it was reminiscent of what he had just done a few days before, right before he was taken into custody, right before he was put on trial, right before he was executed. It was the last memorable thing that they had done together. Then their eyes opened and they saw Jesus and he disappeared. That right there would blow my mind. That right there brings me back to church after the resurrection Sunday is over. I began this message with an eye-opening and hopefully a thought-provoking statement contrasting usefulness versus faithfulness. I said these words, many of us are faithful and not useful. And many of us are useful but not faithful. In this message, we discovered two disciples walking on the road to Emmaus. We discovered two disciples discussing the crucifixion of Jesus. We discovered two disciples wanting to believe the resurrection story, but we found them reasoning and talking amongst themselves, which lets us know that there's still room for doubt. We, we, we discovered two disciples who were joined. I don't know where he popped up from. He didn't come from around a tree. It's a road to Emmaus. I'm assuming it's a dirt road in open space. And all of a sudden, where you come from? Two disciples who found this stranger to be Jesus. Many of us are faithful, but are not able to be used for a practical purpose. Many of us are faithful, but not able to be used for a practical purpose. And many of us are able to be used for a practical purpose, but are not faithful. This, this, I, I want to paint this picture. You got these two disciples. They are walking down the road to Emmaus. Emmaus is on the way to Galilee. Remember that. You have 11 disciples who were named to be with Christ minus Judas at this point because Judas killed himself over the weekend because he gave Christ up but didn't understand that it was all a part of God's plan. So now you got two disciples walking down the street headed to Galilee. You have 11 disciples who hung out with Jesus who were, who were directed personally by Jesus, who were handpicked by Jesus, and they are in a room hiding. The 11 disciples were shaken by the event. The 11 disciples who were in hiding were not immediately stirred into action. Luke chapter 24, verse 30, and it came to pass, uh, as he sat at meat with them, 
he took bread, he blessed it and broke it and gave to them and their eyes were open and they knew him and he vanished out of their sight. And they said one to another, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked with us by the way and while he opened scripture to us? On this hand, you got 11 disciples who were handpicked by Christ, who spent time with him, who watched miracles, and yet when the resurrection happened, we find them hiding in a room. But you got two who were faithful enough, bold enough, may not have been used or handpicked like the other 11, but they were crazy enough to follow instructions. Mark chapter 16 and verse 7, Jesus, the, the angel told Mary, go and tell my disciples and Peter. Now I've set this up the entire time. If you read inside Luke chapter 24, Alphaeus said this words. He said we were in the room when the two women came and told us that the body was gone. He said we were in the room when two of the disciples went back to the tomb with the two women and met Jesus along the way. We were, we were in the room when they got back and, 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 and the angel told Ma, Martha to tell us, his disciples, to go before him. Tell us and Peter to go before him into Galilee. And we were crazy enough to get up and start walking. See, I, I want you to understand something and I need you to understand something. Everybody's not ready to walk the walk. It's a lot of folk talking. It's a lot of folk dressed up. It's a lot of folk attending church, but everybody is not ready to walk this salvation walk. I, I, I'm, I'm, I believe these two disciples, although it's not noted that they were greatly used, are here identified, and even though they not have been, may not have been usable, they were still faithful. I need you to understand something. There's something about your faithfulness. You may not be the person standing in front of the church let me tell you something. The people who stand in front of the church are not always the most faithful. It's, it's that person that walks in, I'm not going to call you out, but a walk in on a Sunday morning while, while Lamar and I are trying to get things together and she and her daughter will grab a broom and, and just start sweeping. You don't, get, you don't get pats on the back for being useful. Folk pat you on the back because you're faithful. But sometimes... It's the most useful folk who are more faithful than the folk who are fake. Full. Mm. They are obedient here to the resurrected Christ. But go your way, Mark 16 and 7. Tell his disciples and Peter that he goes before you where? Into Galilee. There you will see him as he said unto you. The, the title of this message again may have confused some. I do apologize that, but for that, but I wanted to make a point because some of us in our Christianity are shaken. Some of us came to Christ because we had some things shake us in our lives. You may have survived a car accident. You you may have survived a bad relationship. You may have survived uh, several different things, and so we come to Christ because we've had a shakeup in our lives and and that's okay I'm not knocking you for that congratulations uh, I'm gonna sing the song how did you get here that was random I'm sorry come on back <laughs> Woo. but some of us are here because God has done enough and if he never does anything else, we are stirred in our spirit to serve him with everything we got. I may, may not be you, so I'll just be me. I, I, I came here to remind the believer. I came here to remind the believer we cannot afford to be shaken by tragedy. The, the disciples were shaken by tragedy. A tragedy that Christ told them was going to happen. And here they are. Peter, he denied him. I will go with you to the grave. I will die with you. You the one that was with him. No, -uh, it wasn't me. It wasn't me, player. You got the wrong one. He denied him just like Jesus said. 
We should not become sidetracked by the obstacles of our personal situations each Sunday morning before we start service, before we start worship, we come in not to, to, to talk about the stuff that went wrong this week, but to thank God that we survived the week to get to this place, to get the word so that we can be strengthened to go into the next week. These two disciples epitomize to me the words of Christ. They received the command to meet the resurrected Savior in Galilee. They packed what they had and began their journey. Along their journey, they met a stranger who ended up being Christ. These two disciples wasted no time in being obedient to the directives that Christ left. They didn't act as if they had already arrived. They said, I still got a journey and God has given us a commission to go. I'm gonna pack my stuff and we out. They didn't demand to be addressed by a title. They remembered they had a destination to reach and, and this is what I love. Here it is, Luke chapter 24. They're sitting there and, and at Alpheus house, let's just say that, and here it is, Jesus is in charge. He breaks bread, he blesses it, he, 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 he gave, it, gave it to both of them and he disappeared. In that instant, they recognized it was him. Now, this, this is where I really, I said all that stuff to say this because I really want us to pay attention to what happens next. What happens next was they did not get up and continue on their journey. They got up and went back to find the other hidden disciples. Here it is, Luke chapter 24 and 33. And they rose up, the, not, not the next day, the same hour. Listen, imagine that weekend. Thursday night, you sitting down there and you eating with Christ. He breaks bread. He gives it to you. He tells of his sacrifice. This is my body, which was broken for you. This is my blood. This is the new covenant that I'm going to write in my blood. Because you believe I'm the Christ, you know I'm not telling a lie. Then the next thing you know, he tells John, hey, go, go Judas, go do what you got to do. Next thing you know, here come the police. They snatch him up in the garden. He's arrested. He's put on trial. They, they didn't, they didn't, they didn't, they didn't, they couldn't get uh, Barabbas. So they released Barabbas and said, take him instead. We want him dead. Kill him, kill him, put him to death. I'm, I'm making this really full, but I need you to see that this is how the weekend went for the disciples of Christ. I need you to see that they went through trauma in their minds and some of them were so shaken that when they got home, they didn't come out. And the problem now in the church is you got folk who come to church who just want to be in relationship with God who see so much junk going on in the church that they're traumatized and I don't want to go back to church no more but I want to say this to you you few disciples who got up faithfully to follow directions who got up to walk on the Galilee when you when you met Christ when he reveals himself to you don't waste one minute. Get up. Turn around. Let's go back. Because I'm not going after the sinner. That, that, that reclaiming the believer has nothing to do with the sinner. For all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But I'm going after those who believe but are so frustrated in their beliefs that they rather stay isolated. Yeah. That they rather, if, if I got to put up with church junk, I'd rather stay home. I'd rather get to know God by myself. And that's cool. That's real cool. Bless you if you're strong enough to know God by yourself and not fall into your temptation. But, but the Bible says, forsake not the assembling one another. 
that we got to come together. We've got to come together. When I don't see you, you get a text message from me. Don't make me put out a search for you. I sent that message out a few weeks ago, and I'm, I'm, I'm promising you, I'm about to put a search party together for a couple of people. You know why? Because you need faithful, useful people. What I don't need in my life, I'll say this publicly, is trashy people. I don't need people keeping up junk. I'm 42 years old. You ask me a question, you're going to get an answer. You might not like it. But you're going to get the truth. You know why? Because at this age, I've learned not, waste, not to waste my time, not to waste my energy, to say where I am, what I need, and to let people know where you are so that you can live life effectively. I'm closer to a century than I am to birth, so I don't know how much time I got left. You don't have time to play with your life. The road to Emmaus is a testament to the believer who is not shaken by the tragedy of the crucifixion. The road to Emmaus is an encouragement to the believer who is stirred into action because they understand what the crucifixion means to them and to the lost. When we take into account the present state of the believer, we will discover that most people are shaken in their faith. We will discover that most people are paralyzed in their walk with God. And we will discover that most people are immobilized by their own disbelief. These shaken believers, they remind me of something else that I read in scripture. They are reminiscent of the spies who were sent into the promised land. They were sent into the promised land, a land that God promised he would give. If, if, I, if I, I got a dollar in my pocket, I got a dollar because that's when I hid from my wife because she steals, I'm working on that. But I hid this one and now she knows I got it, it might not last. But I'm gonna promise this. I'm, this oh, it's a dollar, it's just a dollar, so don't jump on me. But it's a dollar, I'm gonna give you this dollar when service is over. You don't have to hunt me down for something that I promised you. You, you don't have to doubt if I promised I'm gonna do something for you, then I'm gonna do what I said I'm gonna do. No matter the value, no, no matter the, the size, the promise still remains. These disciples did not take Christ's word as a promise. They took it as a problem. That's why they tried to resolve, Lord, you can't die. I gotta die. I came here to die. I promised that my blood would redeem man. So you can't stop me because you got a problem and, and, and your problem can't present itself as a tragedy to you. And when you see tragedy, you're shaking in your faith. You're stopped in your tracks. You're immobilized in your disbelief. You're paralyzed in your walk. But I need some believers, anywhere some believers, to look at the tragedy of the work on the cross and be stirred into action. Because I don't need shaking people. I need stirred folk. Shaking folk ain't going to do nothing but stir some stuff up in its place. But stirred folk go move and mobilize and affect. And see, the, the, the thing that I love about this scripture is this. I've looked over this scripture a long time. But they went back to help those who couldn't move beyond the tragedy. See, I'm a preacher. I come here on Sundays. Y'all come see me. But you go home to folk who are shaken. My job is to stir you. Your job is to stir them. We have a work that still has to be done. 
The one thing I learned a long time ago, I don't count seats. I don't count heads. I don't care how many people are in here. I'm going to give you the best that God has to offer because you need the best. And when you get the best, you'll give the best. And that's what it's truly all about. Not your offering, but yourself. Yourself. And when you, get, when you have something to give, when you have substance, I know I gave you a lot to think about today. I know I gave you a lot to process. I know I did. You know why? Because I want you to go back and study. I want you to go back and see how important you are to the gospel being spread. How vital you are. What role you play in reaching the lost. The Great Commission is still the Great Commission because lost folk are still lost. Lord, we thank you. Thank you for finding us. Thank you for making us faithful even when we didn't feel useful. Thank you for allowing us to be useful even when we didn't fit being faithful. God, I simply honor you for your word. Thank you for walking with us and talking with us and teaching us who we are in your sight. Father, I honor you. I magnify you for your power, your grace, and your mercy that is extended to us day by day. We will forever give you all praise, all honor, and all glory. It is in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.